Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about gamifying cloud native. Um, specifically, we're interested in how you can design and build an educational game for your project. And even more than that, how you can kind of do uh, information design. So how do you explain these abstract concepts in cloud native in an understandable way for newcomers to your project or even to the cloud in general? My name is Callum. I'm the UX working group lead in Knative, and I help maintain the eventing component of the project. I'm recently a CNCF ambassador, and I'm finishing up engineering science at the University of Toronto. Hey, everyone. Cloudna? Louder? OK. Hey, everyone. My name is Zainab. Um, I'm also one of the UX working group leads, um, also at Knative. Um, so this talk is just about trying to promote UX design to other projects as well. So that's one of the focuses that we're going to be on. I'm also a course instructor um, at OCAD University and Algoma University. Canada, so I teach UX design and I also teach In terms of my educational background, I did my master's um, at the University of Toronto specializing in Awesome. So the motivation for this project we've been doing as well as this talk is that there's a lot of abstract concepts in the cloud native space that are kind of hard to approach if you don't know what they're abstracting away or you're just new to the idea of computing or running an app. And we were trying to think of a way to make it fun and interactive for new users to learn about some of the abstract concepts that we had within Knative. Um, specifically, one part that's a little challenging for some newcomers is Knative eventing, which um, we'll talk a little bit more about what's confusing about it, but there's a lot of different pieces people could use, and they had to also learn an architecture of how to build their system if they wanted to use Knative eventing. So there's a lot of things you had to learn at once if you're a complete beginner. And so we wanted to visually show people quickly what those concepts were and hopefully make it enjoyable for them to learn them. So today, we're going to be talking about some information design techniques you can use to explain these concepts, um, how we specifically came up with the concept of the game we're going to show you, how you can involve designers into these processes, um, and also just more of the specific development of the game in open source as well. Um, and we hope you can kind of take away these techniques and apply them to any information design you need in your project, whether that is diagrams, a GUI for your project, your own game. Um, also, looking into the collaborative design strategies we've employed and how to use them in your project in involving designers and users and developers. And also, how to develop a game, because that's what we specifically did. So the big problem we had is that um, in Knative Eventing, it basically gives you a set of building blocks that you can use to build an event-driven architecture. But a lot of the new users to Knative haven't even heard of what an event-driven architecture is. And so if we're trying to explain these building blocks, we also have to explain the architecture. And then that doesn't necessarily make sense unless you understand what problems the architecture is trying to solve. So there's a lot of concepts that are all building on each other. And if you're just presented with one part of it, it can feel like a lot to learn. Um, and so we wanted to explain the basics of the architecture in an intuitive way for beginners. And we also wanted to find a way to explain the building blocks, hopefully at the same time, so they can understand the architecture and the building blocks together. Um, and it looks like when we downloaded the slides, the graphics resized a little bit. But um, what's hidden behind there is we basically came with the idea of making a game where you can use these building blocks, and the game teaches you these architectural concepts as you go as well. And so you'll visually see everything working, and it will hopefully get people to understand the architecture and how to use this to solve problems in their own space. So the, we have a demo of some of this. It's a work in progress still. But the two key resources we wanted to design around in Knative were brokers and triggers. The idea is that a broker is a component that can receive data, which we call events. And then triggers represent a connection from that broker to something that wants to consume that data. And so the trigger has to come from a broker to a destination. And then it can filter the data, so you can select specifically which data you want at the destination. Um, and so we wanted to show users this concept of you can create a trigger, it connects to a broker, so you can get the events, and that everything filters. That was our initial like version one. Like, if we can show that, we've taught something. And then after that, we want to add in more types of design patterns and things you can do in event-driven architecture. So at this point, I'm going to quickly escape the slideshow, and hopefully we can show the demo that we have. So this is the game we built. It's still work in progress. But the key idea is I can pick from the middle, and I can say, hey, 
send it over to my source. So I'm making a connection of the trigger from the broker to the destination. And if I press start, the data flows. So we've already kind of shown visually the idea of the connection comes from somewhere to another destination, and the data goes. Now, if I want to show filtering, I can drag a filter. Maybe I only want the blue box to get to the destination. So the red one doesn't go anymore, and the blue one comes through. Um, and this is a lot more intuitive than all those words I just used to explain these concepts. And you can just see it visually, and hopefully, once we get a bit further and there's levels, people can interact with this and solve different problems, and then they'll be able to go over to the application they're building, and they'll just know, oh, I need a broker here, and I need a tr trigger, and here's all the things I need to do to get that. And then only at that stage, they'll need to look into the Knative YAMLs to figure out the details of how to connect everything, but they'll already know what they want to do in their head. I'm going to move back to the slides now. Uh, current slide. All right, so Zane, I'm going to pass over to you now. Yeah, so I'm sure if you came to this talk, you probably enjoy playing video games. So a show of hands, who here likes video games? Yeah, so basically everyone, <laughs> everyone in this room, probably here at this conference, you're into tech and video games. So uh, lucky for us, there's actually a really good connection between video games and learning. Like people have been researching this. So first off, people like playing games. Um, one of the reasons that we use it for education is that it, we can use it to create an active learning environment. And because it's so interactive, uh, interacting with a game can actually help students with knowledge retention because it creates a memorable experience. So just like Callum mentioned, yeah, we can stand up here and verbally explain how eventing works, but watching him play it is probably more memorable. And if you play it yourself, it's probably going to be even more memorable. Um, so that's one of the reasons why people like playing games uh, for education. And the second part of it is that building games can also help with learning. So the actual process of creating and coming up with these analogies and concepts um, helps us form a deeper understanding of the concepts themselves. And uh, another reason why you might want to create your own educational game is that if you're trying to get more contributors, it can be an easier, smaller project to get involved with initially. And another benefit is, um, I'm sure some of you guys here have tried out some kind of game dev that you might know how to use Unity or Godot. So students and hobbyists also already have sometimes prior game, game dev ex experience and familiarity, so you can leverage that as a way to get more new contributors engaged into your tools. Okay, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna ask a lot of questions, um, but does anybody here recognize this icon? Yeah, so can anyone just like say loudly like what it is? It's a database, okay, so next slide. Um, so going more into like the theoretical definitions, it's actually a pictorial representation of an abstract concept. So you could try to explain to someone what a database is, but if you put this symbol into your diagram, um, it's just easier to communicate it, right? So there are a lot of abstract concepts that we have in cloud native, so it's a lot of terminology. And how many times have you tried to explain to one of your friends that's maybe in a different domain, like what you're working on, and it's you try to explain one definition, but you're explaining a different definition, it kind of it gets very muddled, right? So I've had that experience myself, probably Callum has too, and probably some of you guys. So um, one of the issues with working in these abstract computer spaces is that there is a lot of domain-specific language. So someone that's new to the space, having to learn all this language at once, it can be pretty overwhelming. Um, but lucky for us, we can use visual representations such as icons, diagrams, and pictures to help with the information communication process. So I'm gonna go a bit deeper into some different definitions that is talked about. So um, as we just talked about, um, in computing we use pictures to describe abstract concepts all the time. Like any type of graphical user interface is using pictures basically to describe abstract um, actions behind the scenes. So something that's very commonly used and that we're gonna talk about how we use in our game is this idea of using an analogy to explain something abstract. So you can explain an idea, uh, an idea by comparing it to something tangible. Um, who here um, has used like the trash bin on their desktop before? Yeah, it's like most people, right? Um, so comparing, um, sorry, <laughs> an abstract concept 
to something uh, tangible can make a computer interface more familiar. And we talk about this word called um, intuitive, like how to make something more intuitive. So by leveraging what someone's already familiar with, we can increase the amount, uh, how intuitive um, an experience or a tool is for someone. So getting a bit deeper back to the trash bin icon, um, most people are familiar with the act of like physically picking up a piece of paper and throwing it into the trash bin. So when people uh, were making graphical user interface, the abstract action of removing a file, they choose to represent that by having an icon of a trash can. So going from like, so the concrete version of it is like the act of physically throwing out the trash can. And then what we're trying to communicate is removing a file. So there's like this thing in between, um, it's called a boundary object. Um, so it is like a, picture of a trash can so that on my computer, when I go and I throw something away, um, I'm like thinking about the physical trash can um, and I'm able to better understand what I'm doing um, to the file. Okay, um, a little bit more reasoning why uh, we use icons, symbols, and diagrams. So one of the primary reasons is that it's a lot faster for us to recognize than text labels. So I have some symbols on the right here. So who can recognize these symbols? Yeah, most people. Um, and like, what do they do? Mid yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, and the interesting thing also is that the way that you group different symbols together, um, it can actually um, result in more familiarity. Like, if I were to take the big X and put it like on the side that the minus side is on, it would cause a lot of user issues and people would get very angry because you would go to minimize something and you'd close it instead, right? So you have to kind of follow the uh, conventions that people are already used to. Um, and the point of this example is that designers use a variety of these techniques. Like we use fonts, colors, screen layouts, and it's all very intentional uh, in order to direct your attention to important information and also to organize information actions together. So what else did I write here? Yeah, uh, so the last point I wanna make about all this is that uh, when we do design, it helps with usability and it's not just aesthetic. So one of the questions we were asking when it came to actually implementing this in Knative is how do we make these representations for the abstract concepts in our projects? And we were trying to find what techniques can we use within an open source community or in other design contexts to actually come up with these representations. We've seen some examples of existing representations, but a Knative broker isn't necessarily something that already has a representation that's intuitive to everyone who's coming into it to understand it. Yeah, so this brings us into our design process of developing this game. So I'm, I'm gonna use this term called co-design, which is basically a process where you have different groups um, working together to design something, but the important thing is that the different groups have to be involved together throughout the process. So for our project, we needed a variety of skill sets. Uh, so we needed people with some like cloud engineering background to kind of help explain like what the concepts were, we had designers making the visual design, but also like the, the game layout and everything. We had illustrators and we also had game developers. So a lot of different groups with like different technical backgrounds and um, sometimes there's like language uh, differences and like what, like how people communicate ideas to each other. Uh, so by use like the co-design method would mean that like we all would meet at the very beginning to come up with the ideas together and we're, regularly meeting and we're all kind of involved in each iteration of the prototype so that um, every the project like the project is as easy to understand for as many people as possible. So I'll talk a little bit about like brainstorming in general and Callum's gonna go into like how we brainstormed for our specific game project. Uh, so when you have some kind of brainstorming session uh, to come up with a new idea, you should always wanna start with broad and open-ended discussions. So some strategies that we used were to come up with prompt questions. We used like sticky notes for people to quickly like come up with ideas and share them. And we also very heavily use sketching. So I put this, <laughs> I highlighted this because I know a lot of engineers are very afraid of sketching and they think that they're not good artists, but you don't have to be a good artist to draw a diagram or to make a simple sketch. And actually there's a lot of science that supports the fact that drawing out your ideas can help you explain them to other people, but also to think them through more thoroughly yourself. So I encourage everybody to draw. 
Yeah, great. And just before we move on into the actual implementation, I just wanted to highlight that co-design is a general UX design concept, but it meshes really well with open source because it's the idea of cooperatively designing together and involving your users and lots of different groups all together working on the same solution. So to us, it made a lot of sense and it felt very similar to how we do a lot of stuff in open source where your users of the product interact and add their own code and help things improve in general. So for the actual co-design and brainstorming, we started by a brainstorming session where we had some members of the Knative team, we had some community members who had various levels of exposure to Knative. Some of them were completely new to the community and were drawn in by the project. Others had been around for a couple months or a couple years. And we also had some designers from OCAD University who were able to come out and help us with the brainstorming and the design. And we just scheduled a meeting on Zoom. I'm sure many project maintainers and participants have you know, figured out how to schedule a meeting. You just talk on, we used Slack, found a time that worked for the most people. Um, we made sure that some of the core Knative maintainers who worked on eventing were able to make the time so that they could make sure that some of the concepts were correct and we weren't misinterpreting what a broker or a trigger was. Um, and then we showed up to Zoom and we had some prompt questions. For example, the first one was, um, how would you explain what Knative eventing does in two to three sentences? And we asked people to pretend they're explaining it to a 10-year-old. So some things I'd like to highlight here is this is encouraging people to be brief, two to three sentences. You don't want your analogy to have like, you know, a thousand words explaining the concepts, because that's not going to help you simplify it. Um, and explaining it to a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old, it, it's getting people to come to a more simple understanding. And so one of the problems with these abstract, complex topics when you're trying to represent it graphically is, how do you simplify it to a point where people can just get that graphical image right away? So another prompt we had was we asked people to add some diagrams that explain eventing. And a couple people found this diagram in the documentation and they said this is what they liked and this one explained what eventing was to them. And so we wanted to make sure that when we were coming up with a graphical representation of an eventing system, some of the characteristics of this diagram were captured. And so when we go into the initial sketches, I'm gonna reference this back and we'll see some of it, but the key things are there's these lines coming out of the broker um, with a direction towards the trigger and the sinks, and then there's some stuff coming into the broker. And so those were some key characteristics of the diagrams people liked, and so we wanted to make sure that our game and our graphical representations captured those characteristics as well. Sorry, can you go back to that slide for a second? So talking a bit more deeply about this diagram is it kind of highlights the main uh, components of eventing, right? So you have sources, brokers, triggers, and sinks. And as we move forward into our game, we try to, um, again, have those same components in the game as well. Yeah, um, that's a great point. Like, if you're making a game in particular to explain components or concepts, don't take those components out of the game. Try and make sure they're still there in their own form or as maybe slightly simplified. So for example, we simplified how filters work on triggers to make it more easy to graphically represent, but we still kept the concept of a filter in the game. Um, another thing that I want to point out is we got this question wrong. We add a question saying what types of symbols are typically used for different components? What kind of analogies are used? And no one answered it. So we had this whole like hour and a half brainstorming session and we got no answers for this question. And we only had three or four questions. So um, this question we were thinking it's maybe a phrasing issue. It could also be uh, slightly too complex. Like there's a lot of kind of, there's a lot in that question. And so this kind of brings us to some of our recommendations for if you were to try and do brainstorming to come up with your own analogies. Um, the first one you need is you want to have a group with very diverse experiences and backgrounds to attend the session. If you're trying to explain a concept and everyone in the session already really, really understands the concept, it might be hard to come up with a simpler explanation that's going to make sense to newcomers. Similarly, if you only have newcomers to your project, they're all going to not quite get the concept. And so you need someone with experience to make sure that the explanation you have is actually correct. Because it's only going to hurt things if you have a simple explanation that's wrong. Um, and then also in terms of diverse backgrounds, um, coming from different skill sets like design or engineering or even just different languages lead to different ways that you talk about ideas and concepts. And so having these different ways of communicating about the ideas can help come to a better um, like analogy that you're going to use to explain your project. And then in terms of the actual brainstorming and coming up with the questions, um, some characteristics for questions is uh, they should be relating to ways to explain the concept that you're trying to make an analogy for. 
If you have other kinds of questions, which are more about how does it work or something, those won't really help you get to a good analogy. Um, they should also be able to be answered by a person in only a few minutes. I personally think this is a big problem with the question we got no answers for. That question is really complex and it might take longer to think of a good answer. And so if you're trying to get a lot of answers in brainstorm and get this huge collection of answers that you can then combine and find commonalities between, it's gonna be hard if it takes someone 30 minutes to answer your question. And then finally, you should get people to explain the concept in different ways. So one of our questions was asking for diagrams, something visual. And other questions were asking for words. And so getting these different types of representations of the same concept can help you come up with a good analogy. So what ended up happening, um, sorry for the wall of text, by the way. I'm not the designer on the slide, so you can tell these are my slides when there's all the text. Um, from our initial brainstorm, we came up with an analogy of a mail room. So mail would come into some system, and the system would be able to send it to the right point. Um, and so specifically, we're looking at the idea of like a box as a package, and it comes into this machine that then spits it along conveyor belts that go into boxes to be delivered. Um, that was the initial idea. I think what ended up getting into the game has changed over time as we worked on making it into an actual game and getting illustrations. Um, but some of the key things was we had a representation for every of the key resources. So events were represented as a package to be delivered, which is very analogous to Knative eventing actually delivering an event as data to your application. Um, brokers are represented as this large machine with a funnel to receive events. And so in actual eventing, all of the events come into the broker and then they go out by the triggers. Um, and triggers were conveyor belts which came from the broker to a destination. So that was showing the directional component of a trigger. Um, and then event syncs were represented as boxes which would hold the package that were representing the events. So all of the key components were able to be represented in a way in which they were still analogous to what they actually were in eventing. And so that was what we really liked about this representation. Each of the components would still have the key characteristics that they had in eventing represented with this analogy. Um, one thing that's not a perfect analogy though is in eventing, one event into the broker can go to 20 destinations. But in real life, if you send one package to the mailroom, they can't copy it 20 times and send that package to everyone. You need to give them 20 letters. So that's fine, you don't need to have the perfect analogy, but having a good analogy can help you get a long way. And that's also why our mailroom was a big metal box. We were thinking we can just have a robot that copies and it. it's a game and so no one's gonna really care too much about that. So at this point we had an analogy and we were trying to figure out how do we actually turn it into a more concrete representation? Because we need to show this in a game, we need to actually build the game. Um, and so the first thing we were doing is we did a lot of sketching as Zainab was talking about. Um, and so every week people would meet and we'd have some sketches and we'd talk through the concept and see if it made sense and see if the game made sense from these sketches. And you can see they're not amazing sketches. Like, I'm not an artist um, and these are probably a bit better than I could do, but there's not a need to stress about being an amazing drawer or illustrator to create these sketches. And it took a lot of weeks of brainstorming on these illustrations and iterating before we were really happy with the concept for the game. Yeah, so I can kind of explain the process of how the sketches evolve. So one really nice thing about these like, you know, quick sketches is that you can iterate and change them really quickly. And because like we didn't spend that much time on it, we're a lot more open to pivoting and changing the, changing the game completely. So I'll start with like the leftmost Im rightmost image <laughs> that has like on the far left we have like our mascot quack that we're trying to incorporate into the game but we decided it didn't really fit we were also thinking of having like kind of game gamification features like characters that you have to like feed events to but then we're like oh we don't really like that that much we kind of scrapped that idea below that we were gonna have like a robot character be the broker but then we're like ah oh, maybe not and then we kind of started drawing like conveyor belts and packages and then like in the middle the robot kind of reappears um, but, and then I think the furthest right one is again like a conveyor belt with like destinations, like multiple destinations and kind of like at the bottom we have different um, like users that are like interacting with the events. Um, but we again like did not go with any of these ideas and the next slide is going to show with the idea that we did go with. Yeah, I think what's worth noting is actually like we did have the mill room analogy before we started the sketching. But as we did the sketching we still iterated on other ideas to see if there was maybe something that represented better visually when you actually start to sketch out as a game. We ended up sticking with the mailroom concept and on the, I guess the right from your perspective was the kind of low fidelity concept sketch that we went with. So there's the funnel, 
there's some conveyor belts coming into it, and then there's conveyor belts going out with these packages to some certain destinations. And the idea was that these packages would have different shapes and colors, and those would be the things that you could filter on. So you could say, hey, I want a red triangle or a blue circle. Um, and then on the, the left, there is the high fidelity concept sketch where um, Shemaima Mobin, who was one of the designers we worked with, was able to make a much better looking version of the sketch that we could work with. Um, so this led us to being able to start to build the first version of this prototype on Godot. Um, and one of the things that I'd like to call out here is that actually doing the development requires a lot of designer developer collaboration. So the developers often need assets from designers, um, and the designers are often gonna have feedback on the current prototype. And so we were having a weekly meeting where there were some designers and developers and they could speak. And so one of the things which actually like, was kind of a mis bit of a miscommunication in the past few weeks as we were making this prototype is if you look back here, the funnel was the, the main central component where all the data was coming into. Um, and we didn't actually have anything in the high fidelity sketch that represented the filters on a trigger. And so when one of the developers was working on implementing the filters, they decided to use the funnel asset to represent the filter. And so that's what's currently in the prototype. But going forwards, we're gonna need to work with the designers to bet, get a better asset for what the filter should look like so that we can use the funnel how it was intended to be used. Um, in terms of finding game developers, there's often a lot of students with game developer experience who you can like, explain to your project if you know universities in your area. Um, also, there's just a lot of online resources on this concept, and especially in Godot, it's not particularly hard programming if you're used to a lot of harder cloud projects, like a very simple game, 2D like we have, the programming itself is not so much the hard part. Um, that's also why we didn't really get into any of the code in this talk. There's enough resources out there that you should be able to figure it out on your own from those resources, which will be better than ours. But we will be adding it to the Knative code base. Soon. It's already there. It is already there. <laughs> so some of the benefits from this project um, was it engaged a lot of students and first time contributors, both on the design side and the development side. We had multiple new developers who were working on the game code and learned a lot about the project and its benefits. Um, yeah, people love video games and game development. So it's a great way to get people involved in your project and get a little bit of excitement from some new people. Um, it also improves an introduction to your project. This game, once it's finished, will really help us introduce many of the concepts about both what the components are in Knative and how people can use them. Um, and the same information design techniques can be applied to other parts of the project. So we now have better ideas of diagrams we can use to represent eventing, or if we were to build a GUI in the future, we'd have some ideas about what characteristics should it have and how do people like this represented visually. So, if you're interested in helping out on this project, there's the, some links in the slides are available on Sketch as well, but um, come join the Knative community. Um, that Slack channel takes you to the Knative game Slack channel, which is where we've been working on the project. And as of like an hour or two ago, the repo is also in Knative, and so um, if you're in the Slack channel, we'll be able to point you at the game if you're interested. Um, I'd like to give some quick shout outs to everyone who helped on this project. We had Angelina Zai, who was one of the game developers we worked with, as well as the designer. Um, there's myself, Jamie Lee, another great game developer. Leo Lee, he helped on the eventing, explaining. We had Mariana Mejia, who's one of the designers we worked with. Pierangelo, who I think is in the audience. Hey, Pierangelo. <laughs> he helped with explaining a lot of the eventing concepts to us. Um, Shemaima did a lot of the illustrations, and Zainab did a lot of the design as well. So if you are looking to do this yourself and you're looking for game developers or designers, a lot of these people would be good to talk to and they have experience in the area. And I think this is actually where we finish the talk itself and we open the floor to any questions. Um, there's a microphone there if people want to ask questions or you can also shout it and we'll repeat it here for the uh, recording. Not directly related to the games, but we found um, having a graphic artist in the room who was able to conceptualise concepts as graphics uh, makes it a whole lot easier to explain to different cultural uh, environments. Um, so top marks for doing all of this stuff. Thank you. I know that wasn't really a question, but I do still want to respond to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think um, even if you find like graphical artists that maybe don't know so much about the cloud space, that's kind of why we're like 
really pushing for more like simple sketching and like as like like as we were I have we have this giant fig jam file where like as people were talking in the meeting I was trying to like just draw out what they were describing and then I can kind of show it to them and be like oh like is this what you were describing and sometimes they're like no not at all and then we like draw it again right so I think um, you can engage people that don't currently have a cloud background but if you're willing to kind of explain stuff and work with them um, and kind of work with people like if you work with people over time you're both going to end up like adopting the other person's language as well uh, so hopefully we, we're going to see more collaborations like that in the cncf space yeah and as one of the people with the development background who was trying to help get the designers involved it definitely forced me to find simpler explanations for a lot of this stuff which are still good explanations just so that um, if you're coming from a background where a lot of these concepts are foreign, it makes sense faster. Any other questions? All right, I guess we can call it a little early then. If anyone else wants to chat, we'll be around up front for another five minutes or so. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening.